thanks for coming to our panel discussion today, which is uh, focused on manufacturing, and the title actually says manufacturing and the CDMO perspective. As we have heard many times today, cell, the cell and gene therapy industry is at an inflection point. And we have about 1,600 products now in development uh, globally, and many of them have shown tremendous safety data, efficacy data, and that led to some hallmark uh, market approvals and uh, market introductions. I remember not too long ago attending a conference and what I remember specifically about it, that it felt like doomsday, where many doubted that cell and gene therapy would ever become a viable industry, where these therapies would become you know, commercially viable. The exciting point is that this has changed significantly. And back in the days, as I said not too long ago, manufacturing was seen as one of these challenges not everyone, but many felt might become an unsurmountable hurdle. So on that note, we assembled a panel of experts in the cell and gene therapy field to get some insights into is manufacturing still in the spotlight? Is manufacturing still on the critical path to make this a sustainable uh, reality? So I would like to introduce the panel members, starting with uh, Katrin. She is responsible for the management of the pharmaceutical development programs from preclinical to phase three to commercialization at Gensite Biologics. She has over 20 years of experience in uh, operations. Followed is, on the next is, is uh, uh, Joe, who comes from uh, JSK, he's there the senior VP for cell and gene therapy platforms. And he has also extensive experience in research development uh, and registration commercialization of products in the uh, recombinant DNA uh, technology. So he will also bring a nice uh, comparison to, from, the, from the DNA biologics uh, to the cell and gene therapy field. Followed, we have Frederick. And uh, Frederick, he is the CEO of Jonathan. It's a nonprofit research and development uh, organization uh, for more than 20 years developing gene therapy treatments. And he's also uh, the president of Iposkeski, one of the largest industrial platforms for pharmaceutical uh, production. And then on the other side, we have uh, Kim Warren. She is at, uh, from AvroBio. She holds the position of uh, head of operations, and uh, AvroBio is a company, clinical stage company, uh, using lentiviral-based gene therapies uh, and patients' own cells. Uh, and uh, we will hear now from them more about these, these manufacturing uh, topics and challenges. And I want to start out with, with the question of saying, we have seen these safety profiles. We have seen this enormous efficacy. And now what becomes very obvious that the clinic, the clinical outcomes are not the bottleneck anymore. It's that the manufacturing that is on the critical path. And the question, the first question I have for, for all of you, how do you prepare for these fast paced environments? where you have the regulatory paths that are very innova innovative, where you even skip uh, whole uh, clinical phases. How is a smaller, as well as a larger company, and then as well as from a CDO perspective, how do you prepare this? Making sure that you know the processes, right, are at the right stage in order to go into the clinic and then are ready for market authorization. Who wants to go first? I can start. Okay. So I think that you become, you 
come under a huge amount of pressure to push, push, push into the clinic. And the, mo the more you can hold back on that and develop your process for as long as you can. And it's, it's a, a very, very tight balance because speed is everything. But you have to lay out the path. And if you can wait two months, four months, and then go in with some improvements, how much time is that going to save you at the end? You might be able to make a bit of an argument to to wait a bit, and that's going to really help you uh, in the end because you don't have much time. When you're going to put in those improvements, especially if you have an accelerated pathway, so so trying to get to go to start in the clinic with the best process you can it doesn't have to be final, but try to get as much in there as you can before you start in the clinic. Uh, may I also ask you to, to tell us a little about uh, a bit about what Avrobio <laughs> is doing, what diseases uh, Avrobio is focusing on? Sure. So Avrobio um, is an ex vivo gene therapy company. We use the patient's own cells mobilized from the bone marrow, and then we uh, add a gene uh, using Lenti um, that they're either missing or is non-functional, and then we give them back their cells almost like a bone marrow transplant. Um, they engraft in the bone marrow. They produce daughter cells. And those are the cells of the blood that circulate through the body and now are making that missing protein um, for the, you know, the gene that, that we inserted with Lenti. So if these cells engraft, which we see they are, and uh, uh, continue to make this protein for the rest of their lives, this can really make a huge difference in the patient's uh, lives and outcome. Probably Joe. Sure. Um, from our perspective, we're big pharma, and you know we ask ourselves rhetorical question all the time: What are we doing in this business? Because it's quite a different supply chain when you think about ex vivo um, uh, cell and gene therapy, and that's what we're focused on at GSK right now. Um, so some of the some of the decisions we made early on was take small steps, and we started working on rare disease. And we did that with um, the great hospital in Milan, TJET, and the hospital of San Rafael. Um, and we wanted to just kind of get our training wheels on and make them work and, and learn how to do it. And, and we were successful with uh, Strumvelis. And we subsequently licensed that to uh, Orchard Therapeutics because we thought they were better positioned to take those forward as rare diseases. But what we did is we built platform capability. And you asked, you know, what, what helps give us reason to believe we can do this going forward. Um, we, we made some decisions very early on that uh, virus production, viral vector production, was going to be a bottleneck and costly. Um, and since we're doing ex vivo cell culture, we decided on a platform by which we would select cells. And, and we did that in a way that it's, you can also pivot and do CD34s, T cells, B cells, whatever subsets you wish, because you can change the immune absorbent on it. We use the, the Prodigy from Milteni. Uh, so we, we put that into our system, and we kind of build off that platform so we have this common way to work. And, and the other things we did is that when we examined the production, you know, viral vector was gonna become a bottleneck, and we decided to just invest some technology in trying to make what we call a stable cell line production system, uh, whereby you can produce this much like you would a monoclonal antibody in suspension culture. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, and it's not something you do overnight. So what we do is we also combine, combine our technologies and use CDMOs and CMOs to produce transient vector for us so we can get started and get moving. Um, one of our best partners in our whole relationship so far has been MOMED uh, in Milan as well, and a very reliable partner for making viral vectors for us and also doing some cell processing. Uh, so we, we demonstrated we could do that. We, we, we um, divested our rare disease portfolio, and now we're doing more immuno-oncology because we really believe as a company that... Um, um, monoclonal antibodies took over some of the small molecule world. We think this is a similar analogy. Cell therapies will probably do to monoclonals what monoclonals did to, cell to, to small molecules going forward. 
And we really believe cells as medicine are going to be a very modern way to approach uh, medicine in the future. And just to close before I pass it on to one of our other colleagues, um, we hear it every day from our project leaders and our project teams. We're the, we're the CMC, this group. We're too slow, we're too expensive. And uh, so we try to attack that every day and look at the places where we spend the most money in a process. So vectors, one place, cell processing, and analytical methods are another huge cost because we're not sure all the analytics we need to do. We just do all of them. And we need to figure out how to do that better in the future. So pass it back to you. At uh, GenSight, so we are a clinical stage uh, biotech company, and uh, we have uh, developed uh, RAV2 vectors um, targeting uh, retinal uh, disease, uh, gen, uh, gen disorder for retinal disease. And uh, our, um, I would say, our um, lead candidate product, uh, GS, uh, GS10, is uh, completing the, the readout for the clinical trial uh, phase three right now, and uh, we are preparing to, to file for Europe by the end of the year. And the other one is uh, GS30, much earlier in, um, to the pharmaceutical development uh, in terms of um, this uh, IMP uh, just entered um, the phase one, two by the end of 2018. So really at this uh, antipode of, um, of a product, We'll say that uh, preparing to, uh, to, to filing, um, I would say it's a continuous story into the pharmaceutical development of the product. You have from early development uh, to commercial, really to, to try to anticipate as much as possible all the change in, um, into uh, process development, into analytical development, uh, in terms of um, be able at the end to, to, to document a continuous story with comparability of your product from the early to the, to the commercial. And that's what you are filing, at least filing at least into the, the dossier. So to answer to your first question, Thomas, and completed what Kim has said previously, I would say that the pharmaceutical development is really a continuous story. And you have to document and uh, um, really uh, demonstrate that from early to, to final, you have the same product. Mm -hmm. You have the same product. Thanks a lot. Frederick, do you want to add also a little bit the twist of a CDMO? Y yes. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I would like to, I mean, uh, first of all, just say, uh, so I represent Iposkesi. It's a complicated name, but it has a meaning. It means promise in Greek. So once you know that, you, you better rem remember it. <laughs> Uh, the, um, uh, so Iposkesi is a newcomer in the CDMO field, was created end of 2016. It's a newcomer in the CDMO field, but it's a, a, an old time player in gene therapy since it's a spin-off of Genethon that was involved in, uh, that has been involved in gene therapy since 1997. And uh, at Iposkesi, we're manufacturing both AEV of different serotypes, lenniviruses, and adherent and suspension methods. Uh, we have a footprint of uh, 50,000 square feet, which we're going to double in the uh, uh, two coming years. Now, uh, you know, w w what, what you have really to keep in mind uh, when you're entering that field is that uh, th th there's two major parameters. First, we are in a field where the process is the product. So from that perspective, y you, you really have to anticipate from the start, as you know, as many of a uh, uh, my colleagues here said, you have to anticipate from the start what, your, what the path is going to be to a commercial stage because uh, any change you are going to make in the process will likely affect the nature of your product and this is probably something you want to avoid. Now the second point you have to know is that um, uh, the, uh, these viruses are very costly to manufacture and you know, there's a good reason for that. Uh, many of the methods that uh, have been used in the past and are still used are directly inherited from an academic uh, setting. And uh, what we try to offer on our side is uh, not only being able to reproduce 
the setting the client comes with, but also to propose innovation at all stages, innovation being upstream on the type of cell line you use, on the type of clone you will use, on the transfectant you will use. So try to come up with uh, uh, new elements in order to decrease the cost, to improve productivity. Uh, downstream is important also. Uh, downstream is critical. Uh, and analyticals are important also when you know exactly what is in, in that product. We're talking about products here for viral uh, for viral vectors, but we should be talking about soup, really, because uh, if you look at AVs, you have the, you know, the, the final product is, of course, the, the AV exactly, the capsid you, you imagine as it is with the, uh, the proper DNA, but then you have these, the empty uh, capsid, the, the capsids are not properly filled. So analyticals are also critical in the sense that uh, you want to be able to capture the, the truth about what is in uh, what you're going to inject into the patient. So you have to be uh, uh, permanently balancing between introducing innovation in your process and your analytical, but at the same time trying to stick with the decision you've taken when you started uh, the manufacturing. And when you're talking about innovation, of course, you have to talk about IP. And, and make sure that your clients, if you have anything that's uh, protected, your clients are, are going to be able to uh, use it for their own purposes also. So it's a complex equation, which is really peculiar to viral manufacturing, and you know that makes manufacturing is a, a limiting factor today for gene therapy. Yeah, let's, uh, th thanks a lot for your answers. Let, let's go into a, a little more depth here, right? And uh, when, we, when we had a call to prepare for this panel, one thing that came up was, you know, the speed, the pressures from the investors, the excitement of getting to the clinic to, to get market authorization. And one question, right, that, that also is, is out there in, in the public is this, okay, are the regulators actually, you know, looking at this in a different way of saying, well, our requirements are a little less stringent? I mean, what's your, what's your perspective on this? Or is it the other way around where you feel <coughs> because it's new territory, it's being looked at differently. I'll Kim? take a shot at it. No, no, go ahead, Kim. No, no, you go first, Kim. Joe. No, go, you go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I forget what I was gonna, no, I just okay. gonna <laughs> So I think that there's several things that weigh into that. Uh, I, I, the regulators are aware, especially in the rare disease space, that you could be accelerated. And so the, I believe that, in, that they're pulling things forward. Uh, having you pull things forward faster than the normal, OK, phase one, you need this, phase two, you need that. They're, they're pulling it forward because they know that there's a chance you're going to be accelerated to fewer patients. And so I think that it is tougher than you think, but I think there's a rationale behind it. Joe, your opinion? Yeah, I think um, our experience when we were looking at our rare disease portfolio, um, we found the regulators were curious and wanted to be educated. They didn't have the answers. We, we went to them seeking answers to questions, and they basically turned the table around and said, well, you need to tell us, because this is new to us as well. So I think we've got a great opportunity here um, to help the regulatory bodies to start thinking about it in a practical way, a be safe way, get it to the patients as fast as possible. Um, and I think there's, they're, they're becoming a receptive audience. I mean, if you hear some of the comments the FDA, former FDA commissioner, Scott Goplet said, you know, he's looking at very creative ways of trying to streamline things through the agencies by being able to reference data and not have to reproduce it all the time. And look, the validation packages and the reproducibility packages you put in aren't what we're used to with traditional drugs. They may be N of three, and that might be the basis of approval. So, um, you know, there is, there is kind of a shared risk in the whole proposition because you just can't do it with the small populations of patients we're looking at for some of the rare diseases and, and rare cancers. But once we get you know, into larger, more common diseases, then I think we've laid the, the framework so that we're not gonna have a big burden of um, surprises in terms of expectations. But I think it's gonna have to be a give and, give and take and, and 
talking to the regulators now. I know that the, the volume of CMC questions we had um, in, our, in our first filing were more questions than I ever saw for a monoclonal antibody. Um, and, and it was more out of curiosity, not that we were doing something wrong. They just didn't know what to ask or how to ask it. So maybe someone else has similar experiences. Yeah, I can, I can rephrase the, the question a little bit because uh, I think it was you who mentioned, who brought up the, the testing, right? Testing requirements. It, it, uh, it feels like at least what I hear and am exposed to, uh, testing becomes um, more and more um, stringent requirements are uh, getting well, tighter. Some of, some of it was self-fulfilling. We just did them <laughs> because we, we wanted to err on the side of safety too. How do you see this for, for your products? Do you feel it's getting? No, we're still doing more? too many. I mean, we have to, we're, we're looking at ways to automate. We're looking at ways to take um, methods and putting them on one little platform, like say a chip, mm -hmm. and doing several assay tests at one time. Because believe me, when we solve the viral vector problem, we solve cell processing, analytical becomes the largest cost mm -hmm. in manufacturing a product. It's Time, and it's the number. So I think as we go along this journey, we're going to have to help the regulators say some of these things aren't necessary on every certificate of analysis. Mm -hmm. What's your experience, Catherine? I would say that I, um, I do not see any difference uh, between what um, it is expected for gen therapy products and biotech other products mm -hmm. from a regulatory um, health authority because uh, the, the, the expectations are at the same level. There is no concession on the, the quality attribute of safety, efficiency of the product. And even in uh, early uh, development phase, we are uh, supposed to come with uh, data of uh, characterization, forward characterization of the product. And of course, you, because it's clinical development and because the authority is open to, um, to, to graduate the development, the graduation is only a, a discuss on the, the, the qualification of the methods and uh, first the safety and um, just after the methods that uh, lead to, to characterize the product, but never ever on the quality attributes of the product. We are on the same level. And we do feel the, the same, um, uh, I would say, application to get to clinical than uh, to a CTD. An IND, CTA, or CTD has exactly the same format, but you are not expected to, to um, during clinical, to fill with all the information. They are, basically, they have uh, the same format, so you are expected to, to know your product and to understand your process. Perfect. So I will come back now to my promise. And the promise was to have you participate in the panel discussion. Are there any questions at this point you would like to ask our panelists who represent the wealth of information and experience? Do we have a microphone? We can. Uh, with kind of patient populations getting smaller and smaller when you look at both cell and gene therapies, how are you considering that from a manufacturing perspective, especially when you have to consider the end kind of product is going to be quite varied from patient to patient? I'm not sure I got the full part of the, yeah, can you of the question. Me? Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking about if, for example, on oncology patients, yeah. you may have a TCR, different HLA types, et cetera. When you're thinking about manufacturing, how are you building those variabilities? If we're thinking not just one product now, but five years from now, you've got multiple products in, in a manufacturing suite, how will you actually design and ensure you can produce all those? So I'm, uh, yeah, so that's like platform technology, I think. Is essentially, what, yes. Yeah, yeah. so there's a number of ways to do that, but you've got to plan it from the beginning. 
And uh, it's very, very helpful because what you can do is uh, your process is the same across multiple indications if you set up the manufacturing to be the same. So for example, with ex vivo gene therapy, you, you make the um, patient, you, you, you manufacture the patient's cells in exactly the same way for each indication. The only difference is that you add a different vector, but all the other parts of the process are the same. And in fact, there's even some platform technology component to making the vector. Or similar plasmids, the same plasmids, helper plasmids, whatever. So if you, the more pieces you can put together so that each process is the same, it saves in training and equipment and, and all kinds of things down the road. I, I don't, you, know, you still need to scale out to get to, say, huge T-cell um, CAR-T numbers or something like that, but at least you have a, a similarity. Any other question at this point? So I'm um, wondering if, if you could drill down a little bit more into this, um, the notion that there's a log jam and uh, very expensive manufacturing, especially for AAB vectors. Um, there are real horror stories back in the United States about you know, especially rare uh, genetic diseases having to wait years uh, for production of So let, let me comment on that one. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, s j just a simple metrics. When you take a, an HEK293 cell, a three cell, which is a cell, uh, the cell you're going to use for uh, AV production, if, if you're not using baclovirus, in, in terms of protein per cell, uh, you're going to produce, if you produce an AV, it will be a, a, in the order of a percent of what a producer cell line would produce for a recombinant protein. So, uh, you know, these cells produce AV, but they really produce them at the limits of what they can actually do. Uh, so what you say is right. It, it, it is uh, some kind of a nightmare. If you look at uh, indications like, such as neuromuscular indications, where the quantities of uh, uh, particles is in the order of uh, 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 per dose, uh, which is the equivalent, could be the equivalent of one 200 liter batch. Uh, you know, the cost per dose is just, uh, is just enormous. And, and when you add to that the fact that you will uh, take 30% uh, of your batch for, uh, for quality control, for instance, it adds, uh, it adds even more. So there's this NIH initiative. In France, there's another initiative with the objective of decreasing by a factor of 100. So let, let's see what, uh, what's going, uh, going to come out. But clearly, all the steps of the value chain have to, be, uh, have to be worked out. I mean, you have to work on the producer cell lines. You have to work. And you, know, you can improve the HEK293 uh, clones you know, that much, only that much. But you know, are, are there out there? other systems that can, can work out. You have to work on the uh, transfection methods. You have to work on the purification steps. So I think you have to be, uh, it, it takes the courage to uh, put everything on the table and say, you know, how am I going to address those? And you, then you have, you know, it's a multidisciplinary approach because it's not going to come out only out of uh, one lab or out of one CDMO, but it needs you know, the construction of the uh, appropriate networks. And it's really an interface work, mm -hmm. but uh, we're probably uh, at a stage where the monoclonal antibodies were 20 years ago in terms of productivity, and we, you know, th there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm, I'm, I'm not pessimistic, you know, I'm not optimistic in the sense that it, it's not going to be solved next week, and for instance, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the existing, 
you know, if a product was to uh, come to the market today for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there would not be enough capa capacity worldwide to serve the market. So I'm not optimistic in that sense, but I think that uh, in, the, in the coming years, it, will, you know, it might take five years, we will come to both progressive and, uh, uh, and quantic improvement in the, uh, in the yields. That's the way we view it. Yeah, I would say this is a very nice segue into, into the next topic we want to address. It's, it's this buy versus uh, uh, build, right? I mean, there, there has been these, these stories, even the New York Times, I think, was running a story around, you know, how can uh, in vivo gene therapies or gene therapies uh, in general ever become successful if there isn't even enough capacity to make these products. So what I would like to understand a little bit is, is from each of you this, this whole buy versus build decision. You know, what, what goes on within your own companies when you look at uh, um, some of the challenges we, we also just heard? And then from Joe, I would like to hear very specifically, after everyone else uh, got to answer, is how does, let's say, if you build, if you decide to build, right? How does a GSK or any other pharma company who is in the acquisition mode, look at this, right? Is it a curse or is it a benefit, right? So, Kim, do we want to start the buy versus build? Sure, yeah. Everybody thinks about it all the time, but there's a right time and a place, and it really depends on all of the different components that make up your, your process and your final product. So you need to look at if you, if you know what your process is going to be, you're pretty stable, you've done your um, improvements so that when you do build something, it's correct for what you need. You also have to have enough throughput to justify that you're gonna have a facility that you need to keep at some level of capacity that you're running through. So really early on and, or, or with rare disease or both, you know, it's tough to have the throughput, so it really doesn't make sense until you get to a certain point. You have to have the money, you have to, you know, but there is a constant um, pressure uh, to that having your own is better, but I think it's really about the timing and where you are in the process that uh, we're, we are using CMOs exclusively at this time. Um, it works best <coughs> For us, we have quite a lot of manufacturing to do with plasmids and vector and then the um, cell product, but it's what works for us now, though you have to be uh, always evaluating it and always defending it because of this concept. But, but another way that I look at it is that a lot of places are building their own facility and so what I say is, great, they're building there, so that's more space for me in the CMOs. <laughs> so I think it's a balance. There's a lot of building, a lot of expansion going on within the co a company for themselves, and then also out there with CMOs expanding. And so I think that's going to fill this like five-year gap of where it's really tight, that there is a lot of space coming online. I think our next problem is going to be the people to staff. <laughs> And that brings me to, to Frederick, uh, a question I have specifically for you, right, as a CDMO. If, let's say, you, you make one batch once in a while, right, how, how can you maintain the know-how, uh, the, 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 the training, and so on and so forth? Do you, do you see this as a challenge, or you say, look, the world shouldn't worry about these things? So, you know, so we, we, are, we as a CDMO only manufacture AV and NT. So that's, that's what we do, uh, not 24 hours a day, but, uh, you know, uh, but each day in the, in the week. So uh, training is not, is not an issue. I think we have uh, enough on our plate to, uh, uh, to train. Um, the, uh, um, uh, frankly, I think uh, uh, I, I hear uh, the uh, the message from the uh, from the companies coming to us saying you know we 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 want to see the CDMO as an extension of our own company we want flexibility uh, we want transparency and and these are critical elements and uh, I think we have uh, to make this effort so that these companies really feel ourselves as the natural extension of their company. Because maintaining for a small medium, I'm not talking about large pharma, but for a small medium company, maintaining internally 
uh, a, a, a GMP activity is a, is a true burden. It's complex. And then you will never have access, or in a very difficult way, have access to technological improvements, uh, uh, to new technologies, uh, which might make a difference for uh, uh, which might make a difference for your product. So clearly, there's a there's an effort in the in the way the CDMOs work uh, with their clients in order that you know the, it has to be seamless, it has to be transparent, and it has to be. A, uh, a trustful relationship, but for small to medium companies building their own GMP uh, uh, activity might reassure investors because they feel it's strategic, but I think it is a, it is a real hurdle and it's, uh, it's really uh, it's, it's opening the box for difficulties really. So before we move on to Joe, Catherine, what's, what's your perspective, what's uh, Chensite's perspective on build versus buy? Um, I just um, uh, fully agree uh, uh, about uh, what we are seeing here because um, emerging uh, small um, company like us really needs capacity, of course, but not only a question of capacity, it's really a question of flexibility. We are um, constrained for, I, I speak about a clinical stage company like us, we are constrained with uh, um, fast uh, track timelines. We, have, uh, we are addressing a small, um, most, of, most of us are addressing a small size uh, patient population, so we need um, a relative small amount of product during the pharmaceutical development, and we need to, to, to go fast because we are involved in a regulatory uh, pathway timeline really dedicated and specific. So um, uh, the time is a really the important factor. And um, the difficulties that um, uh, we, we met sometimes is uh, entering this kind of uh, a partnership to, as Frederick said, uh, really um, to consider um, uh, a continuation uh, for the small uh, company and uh, the CDMO um, in terms of um, agility and reactivity. But it's moving, it's moving, and it's, it's uh, become more and more uh, uh, this um, figure of uh, strategic partnership. Not so only supplier. The CDMO is no, not only the, the vendor to the supplier. It's a strategic partnership. I mean, I have to say, coming from a CDMO, that's good to hear. Uh, Joe, so now let's say GSK is in acquisition mode, let's assume, and looking at now all these companies, some have capacity, internal, others not. How do you assess this? Well, the way we usually approach projects, and, and particularly in this and gene therapy space, there's a lot of unknowns, and there's a lot of minefields. Um, and we want to have proof of concept and probability of success uh, before we make large investments into manufacturing footprint. But in the end, we want to own as much manufacturing, our own capacity as we can, so that we can you know, make sure we're not at risk of catastrophes, not at risk of having capacity sold out from under you because the CMO might have other business direction. So we, uh, we have strategic partnerships early on, especially in the clinical space, just to make sure we can get past that phase one, phase two, when you really just start to think about commit to a medicine's development. And it's sort of at that point when we start looking at making the larger investment into what the future is going to be. And, and I'll use a sports analogy. There's a famous hockey player named Wayne Gretzky. He used to say, you don't skate to where the puck is, it's where it's going to be. So we kind of take that approach, like make sure there's a probability of success work with our commercial teams and see what is the market opportunity and then work backwards and say, okay, we need to have this much of something. And that something might be lentivirus in our case because we're doing ex vivo, could be AAV down the road because we might head that way someday. Um, and we also want to invest in innovation because I think we've all said here and, and the audience members have said, look, there's a bottleneck, and making viral vectors seems to be that. And there's a dearth of capacity, 
Um, so what we also do is spend money and time on innovation. For example, um, my team is working on trying to move this, the vector manufacturing process onto a, a suspension culture, stable cell line technology, which I know others are doing as well. But then it looks like a monoclonal antibody process. And we do that very well in the world today. You, you said we're kind of there as we were 20 years ago. Then I could reuse facilities perhaps, I can reuse staff, I can exchange staff, the quality systems, and try not to make it so unique, but try to make it fit into what we already have will help us move things along. And then we always want to have a, um, a strategic partner as, as a backup, where we'll make sure that uh, if our site goes down, we have a, a place to go to have materials made. So there'll be partnerships along the way. But in the end, when we're at commercial scale, we, we really want to be able to, to uh, own the manufacturing space ourselves, because then we can dictate schedule, we can flex with the demand. We don't have to make too many forward obligations to reserve capacity, et cetera. We get, we get to, to do all the scheduling ourselves, for example. But innovation, I think, is going to be very important <clears throat> to get to uh, Frederick's point, and that is, how do we get more out of these reactors that we have? And, and there are clever things that are being developed that we can actually learn from the monoclonal world and bring it into the viral vector world, in my opinion. Which then also might solve you know, the, the, the concerns that was raised by one of our yes. members in the audience. Right. So Kim, uh, from, from an agrobio uh, perspective, right, manufacturing with different CDMOs, and you said it's exclusively uh, CDMOs, right? I mean, you have, uh, uh, still you have a platform process, right? But you have multiple different CDMOs, multiple different sites. Right, so I mean, the, the major concern is this, this consistency of these processes, mm -hmm. right? So how do you deal with this? Yeah, so for the, the cell manufacturing part, that's where we have multiple uh, sites, and, that, and we use the automated system, the Prodigy. So we've worked out a program that, that gives us the best um, parameters that we're looking for in the, in the drug product, and so every site runs that program on the Prodigy. They get training from the same person at every site, goes to site by site, and so it gives good reproducibility across sites. But it's, you know, you have to invest a lot up front to get an automated system to work how you want it to. So you put in that time, and it can save you in, in the end by allowing you to, to have multiple sites. It makes the investment worthwhile because what we really want to do is uh, we have a fresh incoming apheresis product as our starting material, and we want to keep it fresh because it really gives us the highest quality. So you build around that, that component that you want to keep. It's fresh incoming, so we have three sites that cover the world, um, and they each have, you run the Prodigy with the same program. So one topic I really would like to address is something that keeps coming up reasonably quite often, and it has to do with raw materials. I mean, one can imagine, right? So now we, let's say we have solved the capacity challenge. We can produce, mm -hmm. but what we are hearing lately is that there are shortages in the markets around certain raw materials, and it's, it's not a new topic, actually. I remember very well that there was always this discussion around serum, right? Getting access to serum you can use for production and it becoming a bottleneck. And if you extrapolate how much serum you would need if these therapies make it to the market, that would be the biggest challenge uh, no one could figure out uh, a few years ago. So now we are a couple of years later and now stories arise. It's not about serum anymore. Now it's about other raw materials. Right? And to expand this a little bit, you know, there are raw materials which are single sourced. Right? I mean, how do you plan for situations like this? Because as we all know, that can bring companies down, right? or products, uh, the end of products, if all of a sudden you don't get access uh, to, to certain raw materials. How do you plan for this? Katrin, I'm going to stand with you. Do you see this challenge? 
Yes, for sure. And uh, as for other uh, biologics products, but uh, I will say that uh, the, the way that we have managed uh, this uh, in our company is uh, to have performing um, a really earlier um, a risk assessment, a risk-based approach on the raw material in terms of understanding which are the critical raw materials um, relying on uh, having impact on the quality attribute of the product. That's a thing. The second thing is what, is, what are the critical uh, raw materials in terms of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, re reability of the supply. Uh, single source, uh, multi-source, and so on. So it's a risk-based approach early uh, in the development. And once you define high, medium, and uh, low, uh, low risk uh, critical um, raw material, then you can um, more easier um, explain to the authority your uh, process development strategy, knowing uh, your raw materials, knowing their impact on your product, and, um, and gaining uh, in product and uh, process knowledge. It's really important to, to manage this on um, a methodologic approach because you have uh, um, at one time of your clinical development, you are requested to, um, for rational by the authorities, which are critical, which are not critical, and how do you explain this? Thank you. Joe, there must be lots of sophistication around this within JSK. You would think. <laughs> but, uh, we, Good, we, he we, wanted we, me to be provocative. We, so we, we, suffer, we, we suffer the same issues. Uh, in terms of shortages of supply, et cetera. What we try to do, though, is, um, of course, source for multiple mm -hmm. vendors, if you can. But if you're single source, entering contracts um, where you have guaranteed minimum pur purchases, um, you know, that doesn't solve the shortage for everybody, but it might solve our own immediate problem. So you make some guarantees. Um, another place is to do work on innovation and, and I think two places where shortages may come up is in cell culture media for making your viral vector and the plasmids you need that have to be packaged to be put together to make the vector. And then there's the debate about whether they're GMP or high quality, and that's a, an argument you could have with your quality group and your regulatory group. There's nuances about the way they're manufactured. Um, so some things we're doing uh, on the cell culture side is trying to move to a, a chemically defined media and get rid of some of those biologic components that are sometimes rare, short supply. Um, and, and we're having some good success there. And then also getting away from the plasma, I think I mentioned this earlier in my earlier remarks, we're trying to move to a stable cell line where we're not reliant on those plasmids anymore. It's a host cell that has everything on board and maybe you need one plasmid, not four, and then you're off and running. And that becomes our platform. So I think there's um, you know, real issues there, but I think there's some ways to, to innovate and engineer around some of it. And um, some of it's going to have to be the vendors are just going to have to boost their capacity and you know, keep up with us. So it's not just the innovation around the process itself. It's also the innovation around how you can you reduce your yes. raw materials in the, right. in the yeah. process. Kim, your perspective? So sometimes you have to take things into your own hands. So we have some of our um, really important raw materials that we keep stocks of, either not you know in our research lab or anything, but you know either at an offsite or at the actual manufacturer, so that we can combine all of our needs, say for cell culture media, combine it all and. We actually do the stocking, you know, the, um, the, the scheduling of large batches of media, and then those get, go out and get distributed to our CMOs so that the CMOs aren't ordering it regularly in smaller amounts, which puts you at greater risk for uh, a back order that can you know, really slow you down. So that's one thing. The other thing is to just be very uh, open about your needs with a supply agreement or something along those lines that lets your vendors know what you need for years, 
for as long as you can, even if you say, I know I need this for this year or two, and then after that, it's going to be about double or whatever, just to give them warning, put them on warning that you're gonna, your, your needs are going to escalate or, you know, because they can't, they're not just going to make things to have it on the shelf, especially if there's a shelf life issue. You really need to communicate what you need often and as accurately as you can and you know, check back and make sure that they're, they're keeping it stocked. Roderick, any insights from the CDMO perspective? No, I, th I think uh, most of it has been said. I mean, uh, the, the, the plasmids uh, are an issue today and uh, even for clinical uh, materials, starting a clinical batch uh, might raise some uh, issues with uh, access to plasmids. And as a CDMO, one advantage we have is really the, uh, uh, the volume uh, that we can order and the attention we can have from our suppliers. And the fact that for uh, many, I mean, there are also common plasmids to many products and that we can, uh, uh, this is something we can take advantage of. But uh, clearly for uh, any client, even for the, a, a simple clinical uh, simple clinical project, access to plasmids uh, has to be uh, anticipated early enough. So, sorry, can I ask you a question? <laughs> so, do you, you uh, order the plasmids for your vector customers? Or well, it, it depends. It, it's, a, it's a mix. Okay. It's a mix. Yeah, because that gets at what yeah. I was just talking yeah. about That's whether you do the ordering or mm -hmm. whether you let. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we, we have about seven minutes left and uh, I would like to use these seven minutes for two things. First, ask you if you have questions, and then I would like to use the last five minutes to ask the final questions to the panelists. <coughs> Titers went up, and obviously those stainless steel tanks then became effectively redundant. I was wondering, with the, the viral method, what you what you the panel thinks about the evolution of non-viral routes and whether they're they're factored into uh, continuing development. Thank you. Want to take a shot? It's it's a great question, and I think there's they're coming. The non-viral approaches are coming. Um, I think the runway for viral, viral vectors are, is still quite long and robust. You know, maybe within 10 years, you're going to have to really worry about the non-viral approaches, the gene editing approaches. But I think in the end, there's probably going to be some sort of combination. Because what we're learning today is that uh, virus delivers something and gives the cell a new purpose. But that may not be the end of the story. And there may be other things you want to do to that cell using other techniques. So these may coexist for quite a while as well. But yeah, I think you know, when I talk about innovation, innovation also needs to be contemplating what's going to come next. You know, there's a, I don't know if everybody in the room remembers the Betamax. Remember that? That was before VCRs and before DVDs. Well, you didn't hear them because it didn't make it, because somebody built the Betamax that no one wanted. So we have to be cautious that we're not building the next Betamax either as we think about our, our technology. So you know, innovation and trying to make sure you're anticipating what could come next is going to be very important. Any other questions from the audience? OK, let's open up the final round. The question I have for the audience is, so if you would have magic powers, what would you make go away that makes your life miserable in order to achieve your, your, your goals? And then the second thing I would like you to do is comment on what you would like the audience to take home from this panel discussion. Whoever wants to go first. We have four minutes left, so <laughs> one minute each. I gonna start picking someone. Well, I would like to see, um, there's, there's some great products that have been developed so far. It's just the tip of the iceberg. I'd like to see more. 
because I think that's going to give us even more reason to believe and more investments going in. Um, so we can bring these medicines that are going to be so vital to patients. I think this, the new modern medicines are going to include cells and cell biology. So I want to see more things happen in the clinic that give everyone the impotence to keep moving on. Kim, I've known you for years. You must have something you want to. Of course. <laughs> so I would say that the, the more effort you put into planning, the better off you'll be. And uh, you know, you just try to, try to plan things out before you actually go into the clinic. Where are you headed? What are the plans? What are you going to have to change? Hopefully not very much. Hopefully very um, small changes. And in a perfect world, Nothing, you know, just go into the clinic when you're ready, and and you know your your product or your uh, process is 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 ready at that point. Of course, that's in a you know you said we had a you know magic wand or whatever, yeah. So so that's not going to happen. But um, the closest the closer you can get to that, the the better off and the smoother path you'll have. Perfect. Yeah, I think the 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 take home for the. Uh, for the clients is really, uh, as Kim said, you know, anticipate and uh, you know be careful with your process because you're you're going to keep it for years, and uh, you will have to to carry it uh, up to the end. So that's uh, an important point. And things that would make our lives easier is really, I mean, you know, any way to stimulate innovation in our field. You know, innovation is not only vector design. It's not only good clinical trials, but it's also in the way we produce these, uh, uh, these viruses. So uh, innovation is important in our field. Catherine? And maybe an additional um, comment, because we have uh, spoken a lot about uh, innovation in terms of uh, process development, but um, considering the, the analytical development, it's uh, um, as same strategic to have um, a strategy for developing your analytics as uh, in parallel you are developing your, your process and taking the advantage of, uh, we have spoken about innovation for process but also uh, advanced technologies and science uh, considering uh, analytical methods uh, to help to, um, to further characterize what the gen therapy product have uh, really uh, specific uh, compares to, um, to biologics in terms of, um, of uh, VG titration, uh, infectious titration, uh, potency and so on, and also characterization of the impurities, product and uh, process related impurities. So there is, um, I would say, uh, in parallel of the innovative um, advances for process technology, there are also uh, advantage, advances in um, analytical uh, procedure that we have to, to consider uh, at the same time. Great. On that note, two one seconds left. Thank you very much for joining the panel, and I wish you a good evening, and enjoy Barcelona. <laughs>